There are 25 companies that are responsible for 50% of the carbon in the environment. I'm just gonna pause here. Yeah. Minute of silence. Those people could fit around a conference table. Welcome to the Driving Impact Podcast, where we speak with leading experts about the most pressing topics of our time. We are excited to have you join us as we dig deep into bold innovations and ideas from today's leading scientists, artists, entrepreneurs, and change makers from diverse fields. I am Kathleen Jean-Pierre. Your host will guide you on this journey. Welcome to the Driving Impact Podcast. Today, we're with Trista Harris, who's a global futurist, also a trans sensor. She's also the author of two books. One of them is Future Goods, and what it talks about is how to use futurism to save the world. Welcome to a podcast. I'm excited to talk to you about different topics around trends, sustainability, social and, and corporate governance. Kathleen, I'm so excited to be here with you today and excited to have this conversation. I feel like it's a privilege because we're together on Black Women on Boards. Yes. And we're also part of Wonder Woman Dinners yeah. where we're building community. I love it with so many intersections. So this should be a ton of fun. First question I have for you, I wanted to start with a fun fact. You ended up on the island of a billionaire. I did. I did. How did it happen? Who was the billionaire? Where is the island? It is, it is a crazy series of events. My friend says that I Ferris bueller my way onto Necker Island, which is <laughs> um, Richard Branson's private island in the U.S. Virgin Islands. And it, it was a crazy series of events where I received a fellowship. Um, there is a foundation in Minnesota called the Bush Foundation. And during that fellowship process, they said, who would you like to network with over the course of this fellowship? And mm-hmm. I'm a really great networker if I want to talk to somebody and know how to do it. And I said, I need to pick somebody that is so hard that I know that I've been able to create this because of this unique experience of this fellowship. And so most of the other folks in my cohort were like, I'd like to talk to this professor at the University of Minnesota or there's somebody at Stanford. And I said, Richard Branson. And people were like, I do not have a Richard Branson connection for you. And what I was drawn to is he's a really unique model of philanthropy that is about solving yeah some of the toughest problems that exist. He's got a larger than life personality and he's really leveraged his companies to try to move his mission to make the world a better place forward. And I wanted to hear why and how and how he could encourage other people to do that. And you wanted to be part of like, understand his process, his thinking Mm -hmm. process. I'm trying to learn as much as I could about the future of philanthropy. And I felt like this is the future of philanthropy. And so let me learn from a person that's creating it. Um, and so I you know, tried and reached out to their foundation and just did not have good access. And then he was speaking at a philanthropy conference that I had a lot of connections. And because when you set a goal and people are excited about your goal and they're behind you, mm-hmm. I got probably 10 phone calls that were like, you want to talk to him? He's going to speak at the conference. This is your big chance. And wow. so I reached out to the organization that I knew really well. And I said, I am planning to interview Richard Branson at your conference. Um, I want to make sure I don't interfere with your time schedule, so just let me know how to do that. And the person that I reached out to reached back out to me, and we had a quick conversation. He said, who have you been talking to? And I said, well, I reached out to his foundation. He's like, his foundation doesn't do his scheduling. And immediately he knew that I was full of it, and so I was so embarrassed. He was like, call me back when you have a like actual plan oh my gosh and i was like (laughs) i'm so humiliated these people know me and this is so embarrassing and i I mean at least you were trying i for sure and i had a really great coach and she was like he's on social media make the case on social media that he should let you interview him and i was like that is i'm already so embarrassed that is too embarrassing so what i did instead is i wrote up a case for why i was the right person to interview him about his philanthropy i had talked about who else I had interviewed in his network and what my expertise was in the field. And I sent it to the person that knew that I was full of it and mm-hmm. their boss. Okay. Their boss did not know I was full of it. And okay. so their boss forwarded it to um, Richard's PR folks. And they said, sure, she can have 15 minutes. And 15 minutes. S- mm-hmm. And so I got to interview him at the conference. It was amazing. And um, at the end, I was really disappointed. And I couldn't figure out why. You set a big goal. Yeah, because you decided to dream big and yep. go for And then I accomplished something that felt impossible. And I was like, why am I so disappointed? It was a great interview. I got the sort of answers that I wanted. And I realized that in my head, I felt like the interview was happening at Necker Island. Because when I was 16, I saw MTV Cribs Mariah Carey, which (laughs) 
I love it. <laughs> which took place on Necker Island. And I was like, that is the coolest place I've ever seen. And so I was like, the disappointment was because I was not in this very special space. So you wanted to be on this island mm-hmm. that you had a perception that was this magical space. Yeah. And it was also a, like a long, long life dream. Yes, yeah, for sure. And so I'm like, you can't, that's like very first world problems to be like sad that you didn't do the interview on Necker Island. Uh, and so I just wanted to sort of let it go, but it still was sort of nagging. And about two months later, I got an invitation to a conference that was about making the future a better place that was happening at Necker Island. Wow. What was that conference? Um, it was through Singularity University. Okay. And so they um, do a lot of futurism training for executives. I had done a lot of training with them. And so I saw it and I was like, I think this is it. So I reached out to the convener and I said, I've just interviewed Richard Branson about his philanthropy. I'd mm-hmm. love to come to the conference. And they said, we'd love to have you speak. And so it they was- They said that? Mm-hmm. And wow. so it was it was expensive to go to the conference, but I had this fellowship and they discounted my rate because I was gonna be a speaker. And okay. so then I was able to go and I had an amazing experience. I learned so much from him and how he thinks about his philanthropy and how he does his work all, overall and how he thinks about living, which is very different than, he's a very, um, a very fun person yeah. that like lives life all the way and I learned a ton from that and then I've been back since then I'm going back next year there is a group of people that convene often and are really trying to think about how to solve some of the world's toughest problems so it's been a, a real gift to not just get to know him in this amazing place that's full of like lemurs and flamingos and giant wow. tortoises and uh, a windmill it's you know like it's the sort of place of uh, dreams and imagination yeah. it's like a world within a world for sure but to really be able to meet the community that he's been building in that space of people that are really trying to solve tough problems and that's the space that i want to be in and how long did you stay when you were on, on this island um four or five days each time oh wow yeah okay yeah. and there's lodging and yep and... it's it is a it is the nicest place i've ever stayed my entire life it's oh lovely my gosh, this yeah. is so exciting yeah. i think that's amazing fun fact to set us up for the conversation for, sure. for today for sure before we get started in the thick of things i wanted to make sure that i understand What brought you to have a career as a global futurist, yeah. as a philanthropist? Did you have any signs or moments or that helped you identify that's what you wanted to do for a living? Yeah, I've, I've worked in nonprofits and foundations since I was 14. That has okay. always been my career path. I knew probably when I was seven or eight that that's what I wanted to do. Wow. I, my friends would draw pictures of Barbie dream houses and I would draw pictures of community centers that would have zoos and a slide and art programs and those sorts of things. And a lot of that was um, my mom volunteered for a community theater that was in a community center. And so I'd spend a lot of time there and just really loved the way that they were making people's lives better. And I knew that I wanted to work someplace that was making people's lives a, a, a better. Um, and so worked in the social sector and then I ran a foundation and I was 29 years old super excited to have my first What was the foundation? At the Headwaters Foundation for Justice which is based in Minneapolis. Okay. And they do amazing work and I felt like it was such a gift to be so early in my career and be running this phenomenal organization that was making the world a better place. And a couple months into the job, the stock market collapsed. This was 2008. Oh, wow. Foundations yeah. have endowments that are invested, and our endowment lost between 30% to 50% of its value during that time, which is not a great place to be as a foundation. And I thought we might shut down. And just to simplify it for yeah. the rest of the audience, an endowment is a vehicle that mm-hmm. you receive grants from? Yep, it is. Um, it's sort of an investment account. Mm-hmm. And the interest from that account is what you use to make grants. Mm-hmm. And because we had lost so much value, we didn't have dollars to give for grants. We had overcommitted what we said we could give away. And yeah. then we didn't have resources because to give Because of the away. crisis. Mm-hmm. And at that same time, my son, who is a gigantic, strapping 19-year-old now, um, was a toddler. And there was a bookstore in the Twin Cities that is called Wild Rumpus Books. And it has wild animal not wild, but it has animals running around. There's chickens, bunnies, um, cats, dogs, parrots. It's like a toddler's paradise. So he didn't want to leave. So we're in this bookstore. 
and there is one full size chair. The rest are kid size chairs. That's like school conferences where they're all teeny. Um, one full size chair and a pile of books that other parents have left as they're sort of trapped in this children's paradise. So I'm digging through the pile, and one of the books is called Flash Foresight, and it's about how to use futurism to get a business advantage during times of crisis. Wow, Flash Foresight. Mm-hmm. And I was like, this is a time of crisis. And so as I was sitting there, I read it from front to back and realized that the tools of futurism were exactly what my grantees needed to get through this crisis. And so we started bringing those tools to our grantees. It's incredible how you just a personal moment with your son yeah, right, brought yeah. you to discover your path and... and understand that new trail. You just never know when you're going to run into the opportunity that's solving the problem that you're facing. And if you're really open to solutions, they can show up anywhere. And yeah. so those tools helped us work with grantees to develop a picture of the future that they wanted to create out of this crisis. And as a result of that, in the following couple of years, they had 10 legislative wins, which was the most in our organization's wow. history, um, because they were able to develop a picture of the future that they wanted to create. And and move towards that. So that really lit this spark in me to learn as much as I could about futurism and then translate it for people that work in the social sector. So usually foundations, nonprofits, also some social purpose businesses. So when businesses are working to try to make the world a better place, the tools that we use are also helpful for them as well. Can you give us an example of an uh, organization that you've helped through the tools of yeah. futurism? Um, I've done a lot of work with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. I was their futurist in residence for three years. Okay, They are the largest health foundation in the world, and so they are interested in um, using their grants to make sure that people are healthier and that there is more equitable health across the country. So I worked there during the pandemic. So to be... 2020? Yep. So to be at a foundation that is literally trying to be on the front end of stemming one of the biggest crises of our lifetime um, was a really what, great Yeah, what honor. did it look like in terms yeah. of it's 2020, right? There's this all about health. And yeah. what was the problem to solve, the biggest problem yeah. at the time? And then how did you coll- collaboratively solve it? I was a part of their pioneering ideas team, which mm-hmm. uses a futurism frame for their work. So what they're trying to fund is things that might be useful 10 years in the future. So okay. the rest of the foundation is working on problems right now. The pioneering ideas team is really trying to look ahead to what might be important in the future. And so when the pandemic started, there were grantees that the pioneering ideas team had funded previously that were going to be really important to the pandemic. So a couple of my favorites were um, ones that were working on uh, contact tracing. Okay. So they had funded some grants that were about STD contact tracing. And then those organizations were really well positioned to um, be able to help during the pandemic. So it's the same technology <clears throat> that was leveraged to follow and, and track the COVID spreading? Mm-hmm. So who have you had contact with? And then the other um, was an organization called Studio Elsewhere that created these employee break rooms in hospitals mm-hmm. that created these nature scenes that were projected on the wall. And they brought in natural plants and smells that lowered the stress level of people that worked in hospitals and huge crises in New York City. Because everybody was like under a lot of pressure. So much burnout. And yeah. people just were quitting right and left because it was too much. Yeah. And so Studio Elsewhere created these experiences where healthcare workers could step away for 15 minutes, Mm -hmm. created better health outcomes um, for the healthcare workers and for their patients, and lowered stress levels so that people were able to stay longer in the field. Wow, I think that's amazing. What are the tools that you leverage to be able to predict and create the future as part of your core role? For sure. So we do a lot of um, trend sensing, which Mm -hmm. is paying attention to things that are happening in the present that are giving you an idea of what the future would look like. So that's very different from trend setting. So trend sensing. You're noticing. Yeah, you're noticing. So give us an example of what are you noticing and, and what are the tools to to be able to be aware of what's happening For sure. in There's the world. A, a couple different ways. So if you are interested in the future of something, future of early childhood education, future of transportation, set a Google alert for a future of that thing that you care about. Mm-hmm. And what you have then is a constant stream of information about what might come next. And I, w- I encourage people to spend about two hours a week thinking about the future, regardless of what your role is. And during that time, read those things that are coming up in your Google alerts, read newsletters of really innovative organizations. But what you're asking yourself is, 
what does this mean for me and the work and things that I care about? Mm -hmm. And write notes for yourself. Yeah. And what that helps you to do is start to to pick out things that are happening and um, pay attention to what the future might bring so that it isn't a surprise when it happens. So that, and that's your 5% rule. Mm -hmm. So basically you spend 5% of your time yep. like learning about a sector that you're passionate about mm -hmm. to be able to eventually like train your brain to yeah. understand the trends, but also build a knowledge base Very much uh, so. in, in that sector. Yep. So Step. that's one of the ways that you're able to um, f predict and mm -hmm. sense the future, but you yep. also have a couple of framework like backcasting. Yes. What is that? Backcasting is a tool where instead of waiting to see what the future might bring, you decide what you'd like the future to look like. So um, my company, Future Good, works with um, foundations and nonprofits and social purpose businesses, and we help them imagine 50 years in the future. Mm -hmm. If you were fully successful in meeting your mission, what would be different in the world, and what would your organization have to look like for that future to be true? So what you're doing is you're creating a space where your staff, board, volunteers, pe partners, people that care about your work are developing the same picture of what the future looks like. I think the challenge in many organizations is everybody's working so hard, but on a very different vision yeah. of the future. Yeah, there's a lack of alignment. Everybody mm -hmm. has their own goals. Yep. So what does it look like in terms of having a backcasting session? Yep. So in those sessions, um, we do them on Zoom or we do them in person. And on Zoom, what we have folks do is brainstorm. If it was 50 years in the future, there was no um, barriers, money wasn't an issue, policy wasn't an issue. What would be the impact of your work in your highest hopes? So we have them in a Google Doc and they're brainstorming one idea per bullet point. Mm -hmm. And then we break them into breakout groups using a design thinking process where those ideas start to get bunched. So things that are similar get pulled together and we sort of name what those, those big ideas are. And mm -hmm. then we ask them to pick What are your five favorite? So as you look at this big list of possibilities, what are the ones that you're really excited about? And we're yeah. very general in this idea of favorite. Favorite just means the one that you like. It doesn't have to be any more complicated than that. So it's what, which one you like? It's not about feasibility. Nope. Or, so are you mm -hmm. in the size of logic or nope. are you still in the creative flow? Yep. It's, it's about understanding where there is energy around mm. creating that future. And through that, we create these ideal future statements that sort of describe what that future state looks like. And then we work with them to make sure, it, does this feel ambitious enough? Does mm -hmm. this feel far enough in the future like you are really doing um, different work that is a stretch from what you're doing right now in this time? And then what we ask them to do is to work backwards and say, what are you doing right now that will lead directly to this future? What are you doing that makes this future impossible? Mm -hmm. So many organizations are doing things that are not aligned with that vision of the ideal future. So stop doing them. They're, n they're not helping you get there, free up that space for more of those activities at will. And then the trick of it is it does not take 50 years to get to that ideal future. It's usually five to seven years for our clients. So five to seven years mm -hmm. to be able to change the future. Yes. And are you talking about sustainability and environmental types of impacts? or? It depends on the organization. So okay. we, we work with organizations that are working on almost any issue that you can think of. Folks are um, working on the well-being of children. We're working with people that are working on the future of water. How mm -hmm. do we ensure that we have a sustainable water system? people that are working on climate change or very specific neighborhoods and yeah. trying to create a better future for those neighborhoods. And so that idea of creating the picture allows them to know what they're working towards. And then it happens so quickly because suddenly all of the force in an organization is pushed in the same direction. Mm. We help them develop a strategy screen, which is a set of questions that they can use anytime they're making a decision to determine is it aligned with the future that we've laid out or not. And that's what really helps an organization move forward quickly. And helps them transform to, to align to be able to change the, the future. Yeah. So we talked about backcasting. Mm -hmm. Like you also have a tool that's called WOW. Yes, yes. So WOW is a, a tool to help you sort of notice um, things that are happening in the present that might be important for the future. And so WOW stands for weird, opposite, or wonderful. So weird, opposite, mm -hmm. and wonderful. So if something is weird, it's just very unexpected. So an example of this is um, Jeff Bezos is talking about using the moon as a place to do manufacturing and that Earth should become a nature preserve. That is a weird idea. It's a weird idea. Um, yeah, and totally. <laughs> How are we going to get how there? Do, how does that work? How many people are going to go there? Yes. What What does that mean? And how would we do that? And it, it just sort of. So that's the weird of the wow. Yes. And, the, and then. Yep. Opposite is uh, opposite of what you would expect. So one of the opposite trends that we're watching now is 
support for racial justice organizing and racial justice focused organizations was increasing on a clear trajectory that is now going backwards. What does that mean, increasing increasing in a clear trajectory? So more and more support over time. So as we as we work as a society to become more equitable, as mm-hmm. there's more attention paid to racial justice issues, yeah. it makes sense that yeah. people are providing more financial support for that work. Yeah. But we have seen in the last year and a half to two years a full pulling back on that support in a, lo- in a lot of different ways. That is the opposite of what we would expect. And so it's important to pay attention to it to figure out what it means so that we can Um, change that trend back to where it was going and then wonderful are things that are just wonderful as soon as you hear it you're like oh that's great that's the kind of future that I want to live in like what Um, I just saw an example of a uh, bus stop Mm -hmm. that the back of it was made out of moss and that moss pulled as much carbon out of the air as 275 trees Oh, wow. And I was like, that's, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. I was like that. <laughs> it's that's full of wonder. Yes. It's good for the environment. For sure. You can immediately see the positive impact that it's going to have. And those are the ideas that you need to pay attention to. How do we have more of those wonderful things? How do we invest in ideas like that to make sure that it spreads, that every bus stop around the country has this moss background? How much does it cost to do that? How Who do does we, it? How, and yep. then how can we spread it further? How do we make it sustainable? Could that be what the side of office buildings are made out of? How do we... How ju- could we have it everywhere? Yes. How do we capture carbon in that way that makes our cities healthier? Yeah, I love the wall framework, but mm-hmm. I also love the three examples. Mm-hmm. I want to look at first the Bezos example around yeah. how do we move manufacturing mm-hmm. to the moon? Like, how yeah. does one do- does that? If you had to solve that problem, what yeah. would you do? Uh, I would not, because that is way above my pay grade. But um, <laughs> what I think is interesting about it is that the person that owns the company that is responsible for the spread of a gazillion products to our front doors all the time is really interested in what does that mean for the future of our environment. Mm -hmm. And if somebody like that is saying, when I see the trajectory of my company and the destructive nature that it's going to have on our environment, the only way to solve that problem is to move manufacturing to the moon. That that tells me a lot about what... It means that we're hitting a wall. There's a problem. There's a bigger problem. and There's an elephant in the room and and the moon and saying that the moon is the solution Right. Is a bit scary. Right, right. So what's behind it all? Yeah, um, p- probably profits is my, <laughs> is mm. my assumption always. Um, but I think it's interesting because it means that people that are responsible for much of the climate change are also understanding the impact that it's going to have, which is a better place than I think we've been in the past. And so it means that there might be energy around solutions that may not involve the moon that might not have happened previously. So to me, that is a really um, hopeful statement yeah. that we are ready to do something drastically different, even so drastic of moving manufacturing to the moon. Um, but if we take a step back, because mm-hmm. like it looks, it sounds like a far-fetched idea. For sure. If we, what is the fundamental problem that we're trying to solve? Is that too much manufacturing or it's not it's sustainable? Po- it's, it's the pollution on our environment. Okay. And so that the pollution is then making the planet unlivable is mm-hmm. what's very quickly happening. Um, and so we have to address that problem in a very um, systematic way, more intensely than we ever have previously, where the previous attitude was like, climate change is a problem and my little piece isn't making that big of a difference and so I'm not going to worry about it. Yeah, it's the ostrich syndrome. Yep. It, sounds, it feels for the common mo- mortal, it seems so daunting sure. and everybody's so busy like, in their day to day that it's yeah. like, I don't understand it. And we'll talk yeah. a bit more about it today. Yeah. Like, I don't understand it. I don't know what is my power within the grand scheme of things. So I'm yeah. just gonna put my head in the sand right. Right. and just forget about this problem right. and hope that somebody somewhere is solving yeah. the problem. And we've hit the point where we can't do that, you know, with the fires on Maui and with all of the flooding that's happened around the world and hurricanes that are happening when it isn't hurricane season. This year has yes. been a big year of floods, for sure. Of of heat waves, yeah. of fires and yeah. and where are we in the the continuum? Are we like still a lot of room to be able to turn around the trajectory or <laughs> so or are we I, th- I think that we have we have missed the window that's been talked about for d- decades what was the window the the window was how do we hit before the point of no return when it comes to carbon in the environment mm-hmm. so you hit this point where there is so much carbon in the environment 
of course it is going to impact the climate. And the part that we're at now where we we actually need completely different solutions. A bit more like different solutions, like more drastic solutions, just mm -hmm. because more more drastic and There are 25 companies that are responsible for 50% of the carbon in the environment. 25 CEOs. Okay, I'm, just, I'm just going to pause here. Yeah. Minute of silence. For sure. So what you're saying is that the problem of global warming and climate change, just 25 companies, mm -hmm. right, that are contributing to half of our problem. Yes. Globally. Yes. And so... Those people could fit around a conference table. Yeah. I mean, this is not this is not about is Tristor recycling enough? That is not the solution to this problem. It is those 25 CEOs making the decision that we need to move forward differently. And it is us as people in society needing to say, you are not allowed to cause humanity's distinct uh, extinction. Um, by your profit margin. So your sort of decision that profit is more important than this literally being a planet that we can yeah. live on. I mean, where is your profit going to live if there's no more planet? For sure. So I think just to pause on that, yeah. for, for a double click on, on the 25 CEOs, yeah. the question is, are they meeting? Or do we have any decisions being made right. during the Davos or all right. the different conversations globally to be able to turn around that trajectory? And I, I Googled that list of 25 companies and... They seem to all follow a certain profile. Yeah, most most are oil companies and energy companies. And so what we have to make a decision on is not about individuals and what they're doing. It's the choices that consumers have. So if mm -hmm. every single company uh, that makes cars said we are only making electric cars, then consumers could only buy electric cars. Yeah. And that would be a drastic. So we talked yep. about the drastic measures. <laughs> Like if instead yeah. of waiting to 2030 of giving a 2050, having a mandate of like no. all the net new cars that would have to be yeah. electric, that would be a game changer. How yeah. much would it impact the global warming and, and turning around the trajectory? around? I, th I think it would make a big difference. I'm not sure about the exact percentage, mm -hmm. but when you do that, then it also creates the space to make decisions about other things. So if cars are something that is creating a lot of the global warming, let's start with the the sort of highest um, impact things and then move down as we go and continue to, to move us towards a better future. There's also folks that are working on things like carbon capture yeah, and being able to pull carbon out of the environment. Some are making uh, cement out of it or jet fuel, or we were talking earlier about somebody that creates um, artificial protein for food yeah. out of carbon that's getting pulled out of the environment. So there are amazing solutions that are out there, but it doesn't help if we still continue to shoot carbon into yeah. the environment. Yeah. So you have to do both at the same time. So just to understand the full picture, 50% of the carbon that's emitted in the world mm -hmm. is coming from 25 companies. Mm -hmm. What is the other 50%? So I'm trying to simplify everything yeah. for everyone because sometimes yeah. people get overwhelmed with all those concepts. I have a stat for you. So 100 companies are responsible for 70% of global warming. So total. Mm -hmm. So 100 companies, 70% 70, mm -hmm. 70 of global warming. And then the last 30% are, are people in the decisions that we're making based on the choices that consumers have in our current economy. Okay. So the, the real place to make change is with those 100 companies. Perfect. So f to get a full picture, right, there's 100 companies that contribute to 70% of mm -hmm. all the carbon emitted in the planet. Yeah. That's number one. And then secondly, as part of these 100 companies, there's 25 of them, right, that f are 50%. producing 50% of mm -hmm. it. And then the rest, the 30% is like yeah. the humans being us making yes. decisions. Yes. So when we look at this data and how we frame this problem of carbon and having all this carbon on the, the planet and that's changing the ecosystem which can make the world unlivable and it's ca causing all the floods and the hurricanes and, right. and all the problems that we experience in the heat waves right the yeah. summer we're talking about this the summer in la sure. it's still warm but it's it's a different summer yeah so when we look at this full picture how we can drive impact is at the corporate level first it's, and foremost it's making those companies change and if that's through legislation it, what it, whatever that is through to create that difference that is the place where you create the biggest change the conversation has only been about consumers yeah. so it is about the individual choices that we make you should drive less are you recycling what sort But of that's only 30 percent mm -hmm. 
I'm composting, I'm recycling, yes. yeah. move towards electric cars. And a lot of those choices are probably because it is your only um, product that's available to you. So in the United States, most of the toothpaste is sold in plastic containers that are not recyclable. Yeah. In other countries, they're made out of aluminum that is recyclable. Why have we decided that we won't have a sustainable product and that we don't require it? So if I'm a consumer and it's very difficult for me to buy the product that's more sustainable, it's more expensive, mm -hmm. I may not be able to afford to do that. But if every company is required to make that change, that is where you create the transformation. So even when we say 30% is about individual decisions, it's also about the individual decisions that we're able to have given yeah. the environment that we live in. Because like the products need to be available. Yeah. Right? And if they're not available, mm -hmm. then you how can you... You can't purchase that. Right. Or you create your own toothpaste. That's a whole different... Right. right. That's a whole different... Yeah. <laughs> ball of wax. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's very important, but I think it's also... What can we do as individuals, right, mm -hmm. to help advocate and, and evangelize around these... 100 companies, what are all the different ways? Yeah, you need to vote. So that is the most important part. How are you holding your elected officials accountable for making decisions about the climate that's long term? So for elected officials, they are on a two year cycle or a four year cycle. And it is about immediate wins that can show a benefit that is that because is they want to be able to renew mm -hmm. their term. For sure. We need long term solutions. And so If we don't ha if we're not asking our elected officials, if it is only about what have you done with my personal tax rate at this very moment, mm -hmm. and it isn't about how are we making this planet habitable for our children, they're not going to be working on those issues. Yeah. And so we need to we need to ask we need to demand demand it is really yeah. um, on a global scale. So this this means like concretely for every single human being mm -hmm. living in a neighborhood. Yeah getting involved mm -hmm. at the city level, yep. at the county level, yep. being interested yes. right, in what's happening around. So what are the different forums that people can yeah. can take actions in their, like locally? Because I want to make sure that we have concrete examples yeah. of how people can drive impact yeah. and resources. So like, what if you want to be part of the change? What, what, do you, what are the three things you could do For locally? Sure. So one, I think it is about calling your elected official and asking what they're doing about the environment. Okay. Um, I think the other piece to ask elected officials is how are you investing to make our cities climate resilient? Mm -hmm. So a, a place like Puerto Rico, where the power was completely taken out with Hurricane Maria for months, is allowed by FEMA standards to only rebuild their infrastructure to what it looked like before. It was a terrible infrastructure before. So that's an opportunity to make it yes. sustainable, green, why are, environment Why are friendly? we not using solar in a place where there's so much sunshine? Yeah. Why are we not um, breaking apart the infrastructure so that if the grid goes down, it's only for a small part of a neighborhood instead of for the whole island? We have amazing opportunities to do things differently, but we need to be asking our elected officials to make that change and let them know that it's important to us. Um, the second piece is don't buy from companies that are on this list of 100. Mm -hmm. And so as you're making decisions about where you're going to spend your dollars, don't spend it with companies that are making this this planet unlivable. Yeah, so we can research this under yeah. 100 companies and make educated choices of not uh, supporting these companies. And then I think the last piece is having a picture of the future that you want to live in. So individually, just as I was talking about how with organizations, we're helping them think 50 years in the future. So for yourself, as you look at retirement age or end of your life, what do you what do you want your impact to be? What's the change that you want to create in the world? And what are you doing right now that makes that future possible? And if you if you want your environment to look differently, are you planting trees in your yard? Yeah. So th there's that saying, the best time to plant a tree was 100 years ago, and the yeah. second best time is, is today. Now. Yeah. And so how do we start to make those choices that are not about me in this very moment and how do I benefit, but how are future generations going to benefit from that as well? Are you encouraging everyone to vision board and create their future? Yeah, yeah. I think it's really useful to have a picture of the, f the future for you and your impact and the sort of legacy that you want to leave behind. And then what I do is compare that vision with my calendar, which mm -hmm. is not always a great activity. Ooh, go, that's the, that's the, gonna be the shock. That is where the rubber meets the road, where you say, am I actually investing my time in the sort of things that will get me to the future that I want to see? And there, there's a lot of work that futurists are doing about um, health and improvements in health and 
there are some folks that are interested in this idea of humans living forever, which I think is like really boring and exhausting. But I, some people are very like, how yeah. do we hit this point where advanced billionaire was digging yes. his son's blood for and that part to live forever yes. and and feels like now he's 18 years old. Yes. But this is yes. not like if we want to save the planet and just forget yes. about our own individual selves. Yes. Just there's better things to do with time. Mm. Your yeah. time. Invest your time in a way that creates that future that you you want to see. So are you are you picking up plastics that are at the beach? Mm -hmm. Are you spending time building community? Um, are you ready personally if there's a disaster? There was a a lot of conversation. There was a, a hurricane earthquake day that happened in LA a little while ago, and a lot of folks were sort of frantically running to the store to make sure that they had a couple of days worth of food. Yeah. And what the sort of emergency officials were like is like, you, you live in California, you're supposed to have an earthquake kit with at least a few days worth of food, if not a week's worth of food. It's a part of the disaster preparedness. Yes. And so individually, how are we making sure that we have a little bit of resiliency for when these disasters happen? And then how are we making sure that our neighbors are prepared? And mm -hmm. what is the community Educating, that we're building yeah. so that we can check on people and notice when somebody isn't well or notice if somebody needs something? That's just what a good community is. And so that you, it doesn't, you don't need a disaster for that to happen. Yeah, no, I think it's very important um, to have concrete tools to also, if we want to be the change that we want to see in the world. Sure. And also I like the, the idea of like looking at your calendar, looking at your vision board and then how are they aligned yeah. or misaligned and then deciding to make some changes, For sure. right? Yesterday I was with my son and there was a local event at the local garden church and, and they were like, you know, everybody can spend a couple of hours to plant uh, vegetables and make uh, life a bit more sustainable. Yes. So if we That's go right. into like, the because you've spent enormous, I mean, this is your day to day, yeah. predicting the future, right, globally. Yeah. So what are the top three trends that you're seeing that are coming towards us? Yeah. So I, climate change is the biggest. So that is the one that I think needs the most attention. I'm really paying a lot of attention to those innovations that are about solving that at the source. Mm -hmm. And so if that is pulling carbon out of the environment, if that is changing the ways that people move around cities yeah. or the ability to even need to move around cities, I think the growth of um, working from home has done wonders for the environment and people maybe have forgotten because of the trauma of all of it. But at the yeah. beginning of the pandemic, um, in Venice, there were uh, dolphins that were in the canals. And in San Francisco, there were coyotes that were going across the Golden Gate Bridge. And in my... Because they got their freedom back. Yes, there was sort of space. And then uh, I have family that's in Wyoming. And every time I go to Wyoming... I just stare at the sky because there's a million stars and they're like, what are you looking at? I'm like, I have three stars at home. That's it. You guys have a full sky. I can only see three. And probably about two to three weeks into the lockdown, I was taking my garbage out at night and I looked up and there was a sky full of stars. And I had always thought that it was light pollution. I sort of lived near a big city and thought that's why I couldn't see. And I realized it was pollution, pollution. Wow. Do you see more stars in LA or Wyoming? I think it's obvious. Wyoming. <laughs> Why there? There's a joke once that there was a, a well, it actually happened though. There was a blackout in Los Angeles, and all these people called 911 because they thought there was a, a a gas leak or something was wrong, and it was the Milky Way. Nobody had ever seen it before, oh and it looked gosh. so strange in wow. the sky that they called 911 about it. So yeah, that you're, tells a lot. You're you're not a seeing lot. a ton of stars when yeah. you were in Los. Well, those types of stars when you're in Los Angeles. It's amazing. My son is always looking at the moon. Yeah. And uh, it's beautiful when you're a kid and your eyes wide open and yeah. you're just, look, the moon, the moon. Every day he's chasing the moon. And when I think about the future and when I think about uh, where we're evolving in the world, like part, part of the reasons of creating this podcast is uh, three years and a half ago, I became a mom. Yeah. And and suddenly, and at the same time, the George Floyd yeah. happened. Yeah. I was yeah. on maternity leave, and and Breonna Taylor yeah. died, and um, and then I couldn't sleep at night. Of course, right? Because I was at, there was George Floyd, and then Breonna Taylor is a black woman that yes. was shot while she was sleeping. Yes, and then I was here. I was new mom, and I was like, and then you have this baby to take care I of, and that is the world exactly. that you're bringing him into. I was in a new city. Ellie yeah. was a new city for me, and then. I couldn't sleep at night because I was afraid that somebody would barge in and yeah. and 
assassinate me and I, yeah. all I wanted to do is protect my son. Yeah. So one of the trends we, we, we talked about is the lack of progress or yeah. in, in racial equity. Yeah. So 2020, right, if we go back, George Floyd, everybody was home yeah. on lockdown and then everybody watched the story of George Floyd yeah. and how he was killed. Yeah. And then suddenly, like everybody understood the reality or mm -hmm. had s uh, some sense of the injustice yeah. done to people of black descent, black people. Yeah. And all the companies started like proclaiming from the high horses that yes. they care about diversity. Of course. Some progress was made, but mm -hmm. now we're in 2023. Yeah. There's a financial crisis. Mm -hmm. There's all these different things There's happening in the world. That's happening. Yeah. So uh, is there progress in racial? And then the affirmative action a couple yes. of, of months ago, that was all those changes. Right. So are we going forward? Are we going backwards? Like, do we know? Is it too soon to tell? Yeah. I and are these part of the trends that you also see? That yeah, I'm paying a lot of attention to that. And I lived in Minneapolis when George Floyd was murdered. He was murdered about four blocks away from my first home. And the police precinct where the officer was from uh, was in the neighborhood that I grew up in. And so um, the disappointment <sighs> in civic disasters. So civic disasters are when society's institutions that are supposed to care for you and support you betray you is a completely different type of disaster than a natural disaster. And the impacts of that ripple on and on and on. And, yeah. and so um, I think during that time in Minneapolis, one, it is terribly hard to see the city that you love burning down. It is also terribly hard to see white supremacists driving into your city to purposely burn it down, which was a huge piece of what was happening during that time was people taking advantage of the chaos to create more chaos and to terrorize people of color yeah. who were already terrorized within the city. And so um, I think what comes out of that is visibility of what has existed for people of color always. So it is not it is not a surprise that a police officer killed a black man in yeah. front of a crowd of people that was watching. Yeah, it was nothing new. No. I think the thing the thing that happened in 2020, I remember I was on mat leave, everybody started text, texting me, yeah. are you okay? And I, suddenly I was like, it's not a different day for me. It's yeah. more that suddenly you are aware of what You're it pink. takes for me to show up every day. Yes. Right, all those videos that I stopped watching because it gives you trauma. Of course. Right, and then you were like very close to the the scene of of mm -hmm. one of the different things that happened, and the whole world suddenly became aware of yes. why are we still talking about these and racial equity and, and and affirmative action. And and we're aware of what's been happening in Minneapolis for a long time. I spent a year on our governor's council of law enforcement and community relations after Philando Castile was murdered yeah. on Facebook Live. And, and that video is terrible. I and couldn't. Philando Castillo worked in the lunchroom of my son's preschool. And when we had conversations as a community after this happened, and we said, this is the case where we will finally see justice because he, he was a saint. He worked in the schools. He took good care of the kids. He was a registered gun owner. Um, he was a really stand-up person. And this happened because the police officer decided that a black man was scary and, and murdered him when there was a kid in the back seat behind him. So just the, the lack of care for us as human beings was so evident. The only person that went to jail for Philando Castile's murder were the protesters that closed the freeway. That's who went to jail. The police officer didn't go to jail. And so this sort of understanding that these systems are not made for us mm. and um, that became so visible in 2020 because we had the time and the space because we were, you know, at home. Yeah, and people couldn't do anything to distract ourselves. So, so you had to notice, and normally the anger is about the specific officer or yeah. policing. But what was really interesting is people had enough time and space to say, actually, it's all broken. It is nonprofits. What are you doing? What's the what is the racism that exists within your organization's businesses? Mm -hmm. What are your hiring practices look like? How are you taking care of your employees of color? How are you educating mm -hmm. and people and how are you yes. holding people accountable yeah. to make the world a better place, yes. but also to be fair and judge people accordingly? Yeah. So it, it it was a very unique moment. Often in futurism, we talk about different trends that are run into each other. And so we had the trend of the pandemic and all the things that come along with that during a time of racial unrest at the same time and they 
they both amplified each other. Yeah. And I think that is what created really some of the best systematic change that I have seen in my entire career in the social sector. But did it stick? Some of it stuck. Some of it did not. And I think what we're running into now, especially with the Supreme Court affirmative action decision, which is only about higher education, it is not about affirmative action overall. Mm -hmm. But the ripple effect of that decision is people saying, oh, wait, we, ca we can't have a great grant program for a specific community of color. We can't pay attention to race as we're looking at our candidate pools for positions. None of that is true. And the intention of these cases is to freeze all action and move us towards a more inequitable future. And so our responsibility during this time is not to get scared and not to stop um, and sort of wait and see. This is when you double down. Yeah. This is the time where you make big investments. This is the time where you really work to make sure that the change that we have had in these last couple of years is permanent and we build from it, not that we are moving backwards. And what can we individually do right, to, to turn around this aff affirmative action decisions and, and change? I think um, for folks within organizations, ask questions about what the hiring process looks like. Mm -hmm. So um, pay paying attention to candidate race is also to understand where there is racism within your system. So it isn't just about affirmative action. You may be actively discriminating in different phases of your um, candidate search. And so let's make sure that that's not the case. In all of my organizations, we've used something that the NFL has used previously called the Rooney Rule, where in our final candidates, um, the final three, there needs to be at least one equally qualified person of color. That doesn't mean that we have to hire that person, but it means that we need to make sure that we have a strong enough pool within our process that we are able to end at that spot. And often when we work with search firms, at the end they don't have that equally qualified candidate of color. We make them go back and get them and move it forward. It may be that you needed to reach out to a different network. Yeah. It may, may be that you just don't have the relationships that are necessary to do that. And so it is on us as, as folks in institutions to um, make sure that that happens and that's how you create change. Because big corporations used to talk about there's a pipeline problem, yeah. but it's not necessarily a pipeline pr problem. Now there's different organizations like Black Corporate Board Readiness yes. in Santa Clara University that you just email them and you circulate uh, yeah. a job opportunity and you're going to have access to yeah. executive level black, mm -hmm. black people of black descent. Yeah. Um, black Women on Boards is another network Yeah. Right, created by Merlin Santil, Rob, Robin Ma Washington, that yeah. if you were looking for an executive and, and to diversify your, your pool of executives that you can also email and, yes. and submit the opportunity to be able to get out of your network if you don't have access to it. Because uh, the beauty and, and also the flaw of a network is oftentimes people flock around similar birds. People just like them. Yeah, right. And, right. and it doesn't create a, a diverse mm -hmm. uh, network of people or, or non-overlapping networks. Yeah. The, the real power of those um, networks and those spaces years ago uh, when I ran the Minnesota Council on Foundations, um, foundation said we can't find any qualified people of color for our program officer positions, which are sort of the, the, the core work that happens to decide where grants go. And I'm like, I know a lot of amazing people of color that would be great. And what is the issue? And so we ended up starting this something called the Ron McKinley Philanthropy Fellowship, which was to train people of color for three-year positions where they acted as program officers in different foundations. Mm -hmm. And we had more than a dozen fellows, maybe two dozen, that went through the program. And they were amazing and they did great work. Some of them, one of them actually got hired six months into the job. So the intention was to have a, a three-month role. They had a director level position open and they said, I feel like this fellow that we hired, everybody we're comparing to, is it okay if we hire her for this? Yes, hire her. She's amazing. amazing. Please do that. And the secondary effect is that all of these foundation CEOs that said, I can't find any qualified people of color. I would say I had a hundred applicants for the five roles that we had open this year, and I could have hired 50 of them. Wow. So don't tell me that you can't find people because I literally have stacks and stacks of resumes. And so what we saw in the field was not just, we've got this dozen or two dozen fellows, the entire field got more diverse because that excuse dissipated and people were able to dig into new places and develop new relationships. And that's where the transformative change comes when the excuses stop. So as part of your core role, you're, you predict trends, yeah. right? The first was you talked about the fact that 
there's going to be a bigger emphasis on global warming yeah. because we've reach, reached that tipping point, the point of no return. Yeah. The second trend that you predicted uh, earlier, a couple of years ago, was this kind of like lack of progress around everything that's racial equity. Yeah. What's another trend that yeah. you're predicting for the future? Yeah. Um, there is a lot that's happening around the housing space. So some of this has to do with increased cost of living. People are feeling really squished and crushed and you know we are in LA where housing yeah. is oh my god inflation the prices for food unbelievably expensive everybody's moving yeah relocating my neighbors are moving to Lithuania people can't afford to be here anymore and so what what I am noticing start to happen is first there was this trend about van life it was people that were like living in their vans and yeah, work, <laughs> working remotely which is just like expensive homelessness like it is yeah. just a really um There's like this very sort of shiny filter on Instagram about what it looks like, but really it is housing is too expensive. Yeah. And so you have made this decision. Um, the second piece that we're seeing are the the growth of um, tiny homes and ADUs are, are one of the things that many cities have started to approve in this idea of how do we better use land. And we created these sort of mega houses that aren't actually what people need. And so how do we start to right size? But what I think we're going to see in the future is more multi-generational living. Mm. And so um, young people have hundreds of thousands of dollars in student debt. That is not sustainable in any way, shape, or form. And they can't afford to start their lives because they can't even afford rent because their student loan payments are so high, let alone afford to, to buy a home And what we're forgetting is that home ownership stabilizes neighborhoods, stabilizes schools, allows yeah. kids to be in the sort of same place as they grow up. And that equity that you're building in your home is really useful when you retire or when your kids go to college. It is a stepping stone to financial stability in ways that almost everything, nothing else is. And so by losing that, we are creating all of these ripple effects about neighborhood stability and about long-term education and about wealth building and retirement. And so I think what we're going to move to is a, a future where there's more multi-generational living, but with things like ADUs where folks can have a little bit of their own space, maybe have a mortgage on the ADU so that you're able to build that piece of wealth, but we can keep the cost down for families. So I, I think we're in for a a big transition when it comes to housing soon. Do you think it's going to evolve to the point of like more communal li living? I think so. I've heard a lot of um, uh, single parents, especially single women, talk mm -hmm. about wanting to buy homes with their friends and raise their children together. It is hard to raise kids. Oh it, gosh, takes, yeah. it takes, it a, takes village. a village. It really <laughs> takes a village. It takes a neighborhood. Yes. And so to really sort of purposefully create those things um, and do it in a way that helps generate wealth for those women that are living together. So the, yeah. the buying a home together, or I had a dream when my kids were little about a neighborhood of tiny houses with a gigantic shared yeah. kitchen and big playground and all of those sort of things so that we could be together, but also have our own space. And I think that's where you can create real change. Yeah. And when you think about life, like, The way I, I grew up, I was living in Montreal and then would leave in the morning, play with the kids, but it was very, like, there were no cell phones. Yeah. And it was like, my parents knew where I was, that I, either I was, there was a forest in the for back or I was sure. at the neighbors. Yes. So it was like the whole street was, we were all raising. Yes. Like they were all, the, all these parents were raising their kids together and yeah. we all trusted each other. So yes. there was this societal tissue yes. and, and connective tissue that kept neighborhoods together yeah but now it's it's we're living in a world where it's like every it's kind of like nuclear family types mm -hmm. of living which is the opposite of communal yeah. living and so how does it look like because globally a lot of like when i think about like haiti where i'm when my, i'm from originally it's all about multi-generational mm -hmm. living all yeah. like you don't need to have a nanny you know, yeah. because there's always someone who's going to take care of the kid. Right, right. So how are we, how are we evolving as a planet? Because globally, it's very different, but also in the yeah. U.S. Yeah, I think in the U.S., it's sort of the devolving that happens. And so we lose these connections. Um, Mia Birdsong has this great book called How We Show Up that is about how 
immigrants in particular, when they come to the United States, they're less healthy, they lose connections, they get depressed because they've lost that connection to community and community yeah. living. And that is what we need as an American society. And we have to purposefully build it and invest in it. And um, I have found such an amazing community in the condo that I've moved in here uh, with a group of women that are there that are constantly checking up on me. And I'm running to the store and do you need anything? And I'm going out to dinner. Come with me. I want to go for a walk. Do you want to join me? And that, I love that. It feels so organic. For sure. It's the purposefully knitting and building. And then what it what it teaches me is I need to show up for them in that way too. I see you had a package downstairs. I brought it up for you. How How are we being good human beings and good people? And community does not happen. You have to purposefully build it. You have to be intentional. Yes. Who are the people that you really want to um, knit that together with? When when my kids were little, there was a group of us that would have um, nights where we would babysit each other's children, yeah. so the other parents could, could be go out off the ch off off the clock. Um, and for me, it was no different having eight kids or two kids. Either yeah. way, it's chaos. It's the same chaos. Just <laughs> feed them and they're running and at least they're entertaining each other and I don't have to entertain everybody. It doesn't make any difference to me on a Friday night yeah. if there is a house full of kids. But for each of us, what that meant is three Fridays out of the month, we could do whatever we wanted. Yeah. I could sit at home and read a book. I could go out to dinner. I could hang out with my friends. Whatever I wanted to do... Because I had these women that I could lean on. and um, That community, yeah, that support. It makes a big difference. And there's also a loneliness epidemic. So the Surgeon yes. General published yes. this report about yeah. all the impacts of mm -hmm. people feeling lonely. And yeah. this all the nuclear type of, yeah. of living, of people living alone and, and right. losing connection. And people being on social media, which are not real connections. No. Right? Having a no. being on a social app is, is not... A conversation yeah but it makes you feel like you're tending those relationships even when you're not and it's very I, shallow that's the piece where you realize oh i haven't i haven't talked to my best friend in six months because i've been liking her photos and so i feel like you're that, sending some energy there. yes look <laughs> look i see you that is not the same as having the hard conversation and hearing that your friend has cancer or hearing that they're struggling with infertility and they're trying yeah. to figure it out or work is hard And they, they're not going to put that on social media. And so that's where the loneliness epidemic comes from, is that you have a million people that will tell you you look nice in your photo, but who can you call when you really have a challenge? And I think yeah. those are the, the relationships that we need to knit together and really strengthen. Yeah, I think it's very important. And when we look at other trends, so we talked about multi-generational living. Yeah. Right. And what is another trend that you've been predicting, leveraging your different tools? Yeah. Um, frameworks? I'm paying a lot of attention to the future of food. And mm. so um, I love food. <laughs> I love food, too. Um, so we most of my trends are very positive. And I I think that we create the future with the decisions that we make today. And so I want us to pay attention to positive things. But I I heard this stat about the number of um big corporate owned farms that mm. are west of the Mississippi River. Okay. And those farms are not paying market price for water. They're paying less than it really costs. But now as we have places like Phoenix and maybe Los Angeles running out of water, there's questions about well, because of global warming. Yes. So should farmers pay more? If a decision happens that farmers should pay more, it is a corporate decision about profitability. And many of those farms will close immediately because it, it the isn't. The margins are, are mm -hmm. thin. It isn't, it isn't as profitable anymore, and so we're not going to do it. So what's the impact of these farms uh, it closing? It could be that we don't have any food anymore. I mean, if, if farms across half of the country are no longer producing, we immediately could have huge food shortages. And so... And what does it solve? So the salt for it is really hyper-local food. And so I think very soon, and we're already starting to see it, people start to grow produce in their homes. They've got, yeah, that's what we're doing. They have these lovely, cute little planters, and they've got yeah. the light on the top, and you can grow your lettuce, and you can grow it your... It actually tastes like the food when I was a kid. Exactly. Like a real tomato. Yes. Like a oh, tasty strawberry. A fresh tomato that's actually ripe when you pull it off, as opposed to has been sitting in transit for three weeks, is a completely different experience. And it's still, but it takes space. Because when you think about multi-generational living... Yeah. And 
like yeah. the big houses that are not yeah. necessarily what we need. Yeah. Where are you going to start having a full garden? Because I wouldn't want to put it outside because of the acid rains. Yes. Yeah. Right now it's it's sitting inside. Yeah. And we need more of them if I want to eat all. I can't yeah. right now eat my salad only from that source because yeah. it's not producing fast. Yeah. Yeah. So what are the trends here and yeah. the opportunities for people who want to be able to grow healthy food away from the acid rains, away yeah. from the pollution. So I think we'll have more people that are using those in-home growing systems, maybe multiple systems to be able to feed their families. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we're also going to move in the near future to a, a time where we have um, more self-driving cars mm-hmm. that are coming to pick you up when you need a vehicle. And hopefully they're safe. That part. Um, <laughs> But I, I will say, I was driving down the road, and the woman next to me was putting on mascara, and this guy had a newspaper that he was reading that was over his steering wheel. And I was like, I think I trust some of the robots more than I trust the people that are here. But yes. Or texting while driving. Yes, yes. So there, for sure, there needs to be a lot more that happens on the safety front. But I think that we are moving towards a future where um, self-driving cars are much cheaper than owning your own car. And if that happens... That would be transformative. Yes. And I think that's probably near-term future. Because the car ownership is, is yeah, it's expensive. It Even is car rentals. It is very expensive. And so if, if we can move to a future where a car is only there when you need it... Mm-hmm. And On when, demand. Yep. And when you're not using it, somebody else is using it. If we move to a future where... Those cars are on renewable energy, and maybe the roads are charging them as they drive. Then yeah, these where solar is powering, yeah. and or s- other forms of energy. So these cars are driving around twenty four hours a day and picking people up. And then all of these parking garages that we have everywhere, parking structures, we won't need. And so maybe those are farms. So maybe we move to a place where that is a sort of version of indoor farming or indoor ish farming where the food that you it's coming to you is close it's blocks away it's not coming from another country or coming from another state that it really is hyper local and that the quality of that gets better and those enclosed spaces mean if you have a drought or um too much rain it's protected it's not food is protected it's not impacted in that way i think we'll have schools and offices that are growing food that you can access in those spaces. And then it'll just, just like we have plants in offices. Why is it not a tomato plant? Why aren't we growing strawberries? How do we create those spaces where we are constantly lessening the need of a truck to drive from another state to bring that produce to you? And instead you're walking down the hall and grabbing it. How far do you think we are from this sustainable food chain, Yeah, right? And the supply chain of the food where we can eat and grow more local and healthier food. Yeah, I think consumers ask for it. And so um, I have a farmer's market that's half a block away from my house that I am at every single week. And I know the farmers and I know who's got the good stuff. And it's, it's fantastic. And because I am shopping, they are then producing more because mm. they've seen the week before. Here's how much we sold. Next year we should. So that's how you vote with your mm-hmm. pocket, like spend, going to the spend farmers dollars. market. Yeah. Where, what else can people yeah. do? And I think people worry. It unhealthy food is a lot cheaper because it's heavily subsidized by the government. Yeah. So, like I said before, vote. Make sure that you are asking your elected officials, how are they subsidizing healthy food? Mm -hmm. How are they making sure um, that they're investing in folks having gardens at home? What does it look like if um, accessibility every every household gets a new indoor farming system every year? If we're subsidizing commercial farmers, how come we're not subsidizing people having chickens in their backyard? How do we make sure that we're spreading out this infrastructure in a way where it's much more resilient. I think that's what we need is a much more resilient future. And when you look at the cities, because it all goes together, Mm -hmm. right? The trends you talked about. How do we make our cities a bit more sustainable, a bit more um, easy to live in, to navigate, but also like reducing homelessness and and a bit stronger social tissue? For sure. So cities are not built for people. I mean, it's like we we especially uh, Los Angeles. It, what are they built for then? It, I, cars, probably. Um, <laughs> and I've heard a lot about all of the beautiful palm trees that exist here and that they, um, one, are not removing carbon out of the air. Two, they don't provide any shade. And three, they're all supposed to die within 
the next 10 to 15 years because many were planted at the exact same time and they have a 100-year lifespan. And so we have created this future where um, the, the cities aren't livable. And if you're waiting at a bus stop and there is no shade, you're going to go, next time I should drive because this is so uncomfortable. Yeah. And now you have another car that's on the road. So there's a, an effort that is about making cities accessible for people that are 8 years old and 80 years old. So those two ends of the sort of lifespan. Mm -hmm. And if you can create a city that feels good for those two age groups, it actually really works well for everybody. So how does it look like it's yeah. if a city that's sustainable for an eight-year-old? Yeah, it is um, safe. Traffic is slowed down. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of green space. Um, in Barcelona, they have these things called super blocks where it's probably a nine block around area and you can drive your car around the nine blocks mm -hmm. but within you don't drive all of that is walking space and green space for people to be able to run around and there's stores and other things it's that like you can communal access. spaces as mm -hmm. well to build community and hang out so you're able to, to connect and to really feel safe in the space that you have and not worry about a, a car coming yeah. speeding by and so how do we create a little bit of inconvenience. Mm -hmm. So before I used to drive my car right up into into my home or right next to my home. Yeah. What if I have to walk two blocks? Yeah. What difference does that make? Does what, it What if you could bike? Yeah. So how does that increase your quality of life if you were able to create things that are um, much more right sized. This is the first time since I've been 16 that I haven't had a car. And I live in Santa Monica, which is a very walkable city. Yeah. And it has been joyful to be able to walk to the grocery store, and walk to the corner store, and anything that I need, I can access. And things that I can't, we have all these amazing delivery services that will bring it right to my door. Yeah. Even uh, drones are delivering food now. Yes, yes. The little robots. We got the little them. robots yeah. that drive around the streets. So uh, that's how I get my ramen delivered. It's delicious. Um, <laughs> but it, it isn't necessary for me to have a car unless I'm going further. And then I call a car service. And so... The ability to access things that you need just when you need them, one, lowers my cost so much. I don't have a car, car payment or car insurance or that sort of thing. But I still have the freedom and flexibility of having access to a car when I need it. And I think that access economy is what's going to continue to grow. And what else could we see from the access economy or the sharing economy that could help us have more yeah. sustainable cities? Think? I, I think a lot of the sharing economy is... What do you actually need to own and what do you just need to use? Share, yeah, to and share and the access to. Sharing economy was growing a ton right before Amazon really took off. And so this idea of let me borrow that specialty charger that I need just for this one event, mm -hmm. I can now on Amazon call and it's, you know, at my house in two hours. Yeah. And so I'm purchasing things and purchasing things when really I probably just needed to borrow it. And so yeah. how do we make borrowing as easy and accessible yeah. as we have made purchasing things that's what's going to make a big difference and when i moved into la after i became a mom i joined the buy nothing groups yes which have yeah been oh like my goodness they have everything so and also to declutter okay i don't need these toys anymore there's plenty sure. i have a whole playground i love it coming from buying so the, the free cycling yeah. and recycling yeah. and and decluttering and giving away as well instead yep. of, of, of buying all the time. Yeah, the sort of hoarding and all the, especially when you've got young kids, they've got so much stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you don't need that stuff forever. And so how do we make sure that it's then useful to another family mm -hmm. and keeps everybody's cost down at a time where life is very expensive? Yeah, no, I think it's amazing. Trista, I feel like we're learning so much today uh, with you. And I want to make sure that we zoom in on what is a trend that you've successfully Dead. Yeah. So probably starting in 2016 or so, I had a trend that I would share when I gave talks and it said global pandemics much more likely. And it had a picture of two young girls at an airport wearing masks. And um, there's a bunch of reasons why global pandemics are much more likely. One, we are uh, air travel is so much cheaper than it's ever been. We are traveling around the world. It's very easy to spread disease. And two, we're encroaching in places where animals live. And so a sort of intersection between humans and animals creates lots of opportunities for pandemics to spread. What do you mean by encroaching where animals live? So if we're deforesting where um, animals live and then you, you live in a village or a town that used to have a lot of wild animals mm -hmm. and they are kind of coming 
back and forth into that space trying to figure out what's going on and you are in close contact with them, diseases that can yeah. transmit from a, an animal to a human can... And vice versa. Uh, yep, can much more easily be transmitted. And so um, when uh, the COVID pandemic started... I could tell very soon into it, oh, this is it. So this is not a two week at home. This is the thing that will continue to spread in lots of different ways and is going to change. Because you saw it coming. Yeah. Basically, it's like, let's, we don't know what's going on. There's this pandemic or yep. stay at home for two weeks and then right. after that, we'll reconvene. What yeah. did you think about yeah. this mandate? Um, that it should have been longer and that um, it really needed to be people not leaving their homes, which it, it, it wasn't in most places, um, and that it needed to be global. And okay. so that that is the piece that, you know, it's hard to coordinate across countries. Um, and so there was definitely an attempt, and I think that that slowed down the pandemic in many ways. But for myself personally, when it when the lockdown was beginning, it was like, or the conversation about it was happening, it was like, okay, this is going to last for a long time. It's going to have a significant impact. And at that point, my business was in a co-working space. Mm. And it was one that was super popular and they had a long waiting list and all those sort of things and cost too much money every month. And so I went in and I said, hey, uh, I want to cancel my space. And they're like, because this COVID thing, that's dumb. Like, <laughs> you're not going to be able to get your space back. They didn't know you were a futurist. Right. And I said, no, I want to cancel. And they're like, you know, whatever, fine, we'll cancel. But like, your loss. And I remember coming back in two or three months later to pick up mail, and it looked like a bomb had gone off. Like, it's completely empty. All of the staff had been fired. There's a huge pile of mail that you're digging through trying to, to find, your mail. find your stuff. And they're still recovering from that. Wow. And so what it allowed me to do is, you know, of course there's panic. And, you know, my, my daughter came back from college. My son was doing high school at home. Like, there's a huge transition. My, my daughter joked that when she left for college, I said, I wish I could home college you because I'm going to miss you so much. She was like, you did this. I am literally <laughs> spending my junior year in my bedroom doing college classes. You did this. I was like, I did not create a global pandemic because I missed you. Um, but what it allowed me to do in my business is immediately invest in figuring out how to do my work virtually and making sure that my team knew how to do that and making sure that we were paying for the tools that made that necessary and helping our clients make that transition very, very quickly. Yeah, when, because if you predicted it, you already had a system. Yep. You applied the system to your own company. Right. And then you helped other companies make the transition because mm -hmm. there was a lot of confusion during that time. For sure. And my, my good friend, I hosted a training maybe a, a week or two into the lockdown that was what foresight and strategic um, uh, sort of visioning for nonprofits around the pandemic. So helping mm -hmm. them understand what is possible and what they should do. And she's like, I am literally like crying in my bedroom. How are you creating new programs? And I was like... First week, definitely crying in the closet, totally fine. But then you have to move into what's next. So I think yeah. what futurism gives you is a resiliency about having a clearer picture of what's possible. And it's the uncertainty that's what's stressing people out. Yeah. So if I know it's not going to be two weeks, I'm going to start to make decisions that are not about being at home for two weeks. Yeah. It's about being at home for the long term and boosting up our internet and the house so that everybody can do the things that they do yeah. immediately buying from etsy these do not disturb signs that each of us could put on the different bedroom yeah. and office doors because we're all trying to go to school or working but like knowing that this is not a short-term decision finishing our basement so that we had more space to be able to be at home and deciding that right away instead of a year into the pandemic when yeah. everybody else was. Yeah, because there was a lot of uncertainty. Yep. We didn't know, are we going to still go, go to the office? Should we move? What, right. are we, right. what does the future look like? Yeah. So all of that understanding allowed it to be easier, cheaper, faster. It was still a really hard, obviously. Yeah. Um, but it, it it's gives, the future thinking of yeah. like because anxiety, depression is looking at the past, and anxiety is looking to the future. Yeah. So people were extremely anxious, yeah. and we saw like skyrocketing mental health yeah. issues yeah. across. Divorce rates increased. For baby, sure. new baby, new, <laughs> new babies being born. Yes. <laughs> yes. But you have to have a picture of 
if if this is the state that we're going to be in, what do I want it to look like? Yeah. I bought a bunch of board games. I subscribe to every single um, streaming service that existed. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, let's figure out how to make this time. How to make the best of this yes, time that's yeah. with a lot of uncertainty for us, common mortals. For sure. Yeah, yeah, a million percent. So that's a situation that you successfully predicted. Mm -hmm. Do you think that we're going to have more global pandemics? I'm going in like I, some scary topic. Here. I mean, we, st we are still in the same global pandemic. And mm. I think that we're in this sort of place where people are like, phew, COVID is over. COVID is not over. And we have learned how to manage it better. I think what we are not on top of is long COVID. Yeah. And There's a new variant that's yes. striking. Some people in my team at work yeah. got that new variant. And yep. it also brings us in the ter territory of just this collective uh, global anxiety yeah. around everything that's just right. been happening since 2020 like from george floyd and racial equity yeah. to this elongating pandemic mm -hmm. and the frustration of people not wanting to be able to predict the future mm -hmm. right then we have like the financial crisis yeah. inflation yeah and all then we have all the things all the beautiful and then global warming yeah. how do we help yeah. people become resilient or mm -hmm. make decisions that to sustain themselves in this elongated state yes. of collective because yeah. it's not just a solo anxiety it's a collective uh anxiety For sure. um, i think people need to take time to rest and to take good care of themselves and we're not completing stress cycles so it is this idea of your stress stress stressed and then the stress sort of ends but it's still living within you and we have to figure out how to get that out of your body is it meditation is it exercise what are the things that help you sort of process that stress so that you're not just building one stress cycle on top of another i think the other challenge especially around the pandemic and i would say around the racial reckoning is there is a collective grief that has not been expressed about anything. So but how do you collectively grieve? So normally what happens after a war, that sort of thing, is you create a memorial and you you have a day where you look back and you remember who has been lost and what has been lost. With a pandemic that is so um, all-encompassing. And ever-evolving. Yes. You you never have a moment where you say that thing is over. And so you never properly grieve it. All of us have lost people during the pandemic. Yeah. And during that time, you couldn't go to funerals. You couldn't do all of the things of grief that we normally do. There's a, a network that I lead that is racial justice leaders. And one of them was saying how difficult it was in 2021 because they were hitting the holidays. And in the previous year, they had lost 10 family members in a month and a half to COVID. 10 family members. That's, a, that's, that's huge. And so to then go into a time of year that is about family and connection, and those people are literally not there. No, is, people are grieving. It's re-traumatizing. Yeah. And so we we talked with her about what are the celebrations that you're going to create that are new that are about those people that you have lost? Are you still setting a seat at the table? Are, is everybody saying something about each of those people as you're there? What are you, what's the recipe that you're bringing forward? Because together we have to process those things in a way that we have not given ourselves space to do because it is about hustle and we're still at home and we're working and we're doing and now we're helping our kids with schooling at home and there isn't any space. And I think this is the time where we need to pause Yeah to look internally and reconsider, what do I need to take good care of myself in this moment and my mental health? Yeah. What is the the support from outside experts that I need to be able to process these traumas that I'm going through? And then what are the new habits and things that I can build around what has been lost? Yeah. I, ha I have a great friend that has this amazing practice um, that she sort of said in an offhand way, she has a volunteer engagement that's about um, leading Sunday school for uh, young kids. And I was like, how long have you been doing that? And she goes, oh, I've been doing it for 15 years. Uh, I said, that's a really long time. And she said, yeah, I started to do it. My best friend passed away and he used to do that. And when he died, I said, I need to do something that he would have done. Yeah. to fill up that space that he has left. Yeah, on and the so, earth. So and that's her contribution. And that so that made. is the thing that I wasn't doing before, but I decided to do for him. And she's, I forgot that's why I was doing it. And I thought, what a beautiful way to honor somebody's memory and to create um, the sense of community and connection yeah. that's really necessary. And she said it was so useful for me when I missed him so much 
to be able to process that grief by doing the thing that he loved to do. It reminded me of the best of him and not of him being sick and all of those things. This is what he he did when he was at his best. And it's incredible. I think I, love it. I think we need that around COVID. We need that around the the lives that have been, that have been lost. What yeah. are the things that we can bring into the world for those people? Yeah, no, it's beautiful. I think 100%. it's important. I want to go into some areas around the future. Yes. We talked a lot about like affirmative action, but also racial equity. What do you think is the future of racial equity? So I think that there is a policy link has this amazing frame that equity is a superior growth model. If you want your city to grow, you need to make sure it's an equitable place to live. And those that aren't don't do as well financially. Mm. And so if that is the argument in the data, then let's lean into that. Let's see what it takes to really build equitable cities. Um, I think there is the the people piece of it. So there's there are folks that are racist. There are folks that are blaming immigrants and people of color yeah. because they've lost their jobs because that is an old story. Yeah. And what is really happening is artificial and robots have taken artificial intelligence and robots have taken their jobs, and. If we're not having conversations about the way that these technologies are transforming the the uh, economy, what happens is we have an old story that we tell, and it builds up this racism and xenophobia. And, and it's passed from generation to generation. For sure. When you see it in schools, like it's impossible that a child just created that from their 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 brain. For sure. So I think what we need to start to do is have real conversations about changes that are happening in our economy. And then we need to have conversations about how diverse teams actually make better decisions, how diverse communities are more economically strong, that the strength of our country actually is this diversity and that we need to lean into that to create the the equitable future that we want to see and that everybody benefits. I think there is this frame of um, white people will lose if we have a more equitable future not the case we can all win there can actually be a much bigger pie it isn't about somebody taking something away from you it's about creating something better and we just don't talk enough about that as a society yeah we could create the future together so that's what you see would be the future of racial equities having conversations dialogue and co-creating together yeah. with all the different identities for sure if we go into you talk a little bit about robotics yeah. and, and AI, yeah. right? Yeah. There's different schools of thoughts. There's mm-hmm. different books that are being published. Yeah. Um, what do you think could be the impact of AI on, on human rights, but also thinking about the fact that, hey, we're in L.A., there's a strike in Hollywood mm-hmm. about the writers and right. and, and the right. rights to your own voice, the rights yes. to your writing. Your own face, and yeah. Your face, your identity. So th- we're going into a whole different era mm-hmm. of, of of the world with AI where a lot of people are jumping on it. Yeah. But how do you see the future of, of AI, but also the future of society yeah. and human rights in the world where AI is, is becoming a bit more prevalent? Yeah. The, the potential of AI is that um, repetitive work can be done by artificial intelligence and robotics instead of human beings. Mm -hmm. And that frees up humans to do the things that only humans can do. And so if that is creating new and real art, there's a lot of conversation about AI sort of replacing artists and um, you can't replace human creativity. It is impossible. There are copies of it that can be created, Mm -hmm. but art is about creating things that are new and different and building upon other ideas. AI isn't built to do that sort of thing. Because AI is going to leverage the past. For example, Grimm has decided that she's going to give her voice um, and people can leverage her voice for AI mm-hmm. songs as long as she gets royalties. Right. Um, but I'm, I'm a former artist. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm still an artist. Yes, yes. But there's things I do with my voice as a French rapper mm-hmm. that I didn't know that I was going to do, but it's from jamming and playing. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just curious about, you say that AI is not going to replace creativity. It can't right. create the new. So it can just leverage the old. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yes. And so I see lots of examples of let's have Biggie rap a Tupac verse and let's have <laughs> Drake do a song about whatever. Um, I want I want Biggie to rap as Drake song. <laughs> right. Just to see it. Right. And and you could you could ask many of these systems to do it and you'd have it in five minutes and it would be fine enough. But 
What I really want is a new artist creating something different and new based on their lived experience in this moment. It's not useful to have AI create something that an artist that doesn't live anymore, that lived 20 years ago, is repeating something that somebody else said 20 years ago. What is that telling me? So all of that is interesting because it's a it's a sort of fun thing to look at and do, but art is made to make you think, and art is made to process you feel yes to process human emotion yeah and you to can, also heal yes and you talked about healing you can't do that by recycling old things you can't do that by asking ai to create something in the style of another artist and it's got your face and you're riding a horse who cares like what what i want to know is an, an an artist that is out in the world what's their interpretation of what is happening in this moment mm-hmm. and Already, my entire team uses ChatGPT. I've used ChatGPT since November, and it for is for writing or for, for which purposes? For everything. For everything. So okay. I use it for brainstorming. I use it for naming things. I use it for the first version of anything that I write. And the intention of it is, it's to break the um, the uh, writer's block that yeah. happens when you're stuck. The first draft is the hardest, and so. For me to type in a bunch of words and say, I need an email that says that I'm sorry about this and I need this by Tuesday. Make it sound like somebody that makes sense because right now I don't make any sense. And it creates it and then I go, make it friendlier. That seems too... There's too many adjectives. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. Make it simpler. Write it at an eighth grade level. Make it friendlier. And then I take that and then I change some words and I, I create my version of it. But it's helping me to get through that that first piece. Mm -hmm. What I've had to tell my my team is that I have gotten some emails that they've created for clients or things that they've written that immediately I'm like, oh, ChatGPT wrote that. Yeah, that is. You have to. You can leverage it as part of the mix, but you have to go back and and add your own touch to bring the human piece of it. And what ChatGPT is great at mansplaining. So what it does is it says the same thing a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. And so I'll read a, a, you know, three paragraphs and I'll go. It is saying one thing, and it is stretching it out into three paragraphs. But there's no the, – the benefit of our business is that we make complicated things simple. And so if this tool is not helping us make complicated things simple, then this isn't the right tool for us to use in this moment. So as, as humans, we need to learn how to use these tools. And then what should happen, just like we had in the Industrial Revolution, we moved from 80 hours a week of work to 40 hours a week of work, we should move to – people working 20 hours a week at work, utilizing AI tools to fill that gap, still paying people for 40 hours a week worth of work, taxing companies that use AI and robot taxes and those sort of things so that the financial benefit that they're receiving as a result of using these tools is shared with the workers that are a part of these companies. And then humans have more time to be a good neighbor and to Mm -hmm. be a parent and to take care of elderly relatives and to run for elected office and to care about long-term things, to create art, to be good human beings and grow stuff. That's what we need people to do. And I think that is the real potential of of AI. That's amazing. I'd love to hear from you uh, worst case scenarios or AI scaries, if we could call them, of like, if AI is left on its own device, Mm -hmm. what are the... Where can it go, which is not necessarily beneficial? I mean, very qu- it already has gone to the place of realizing that human beings are the problem. So there is a, a case of a suicide that happened. Somebody was chatting with an AI bot. He was already in a very depressed state and was worried about climate change. And after the end of a one-week conversation, the AI convinced him, yeah, it probably does make sense if you kill yourself. That would have a positive impact on the environment. Humans are the problem. And he did. The other challenge is AI understanding how to crack passwords and databases and unleashing nuclear warheads because humans are the problem. And so um, I think that we have to create safeguards where decision making happens by human beings. Mm -hmm. So, yes, we can utilize AI to create different things and to be in that sort of space of of taking ideas and trying to make them into something new but when it comes to decisions people make decisions and within every organization we have to come up with our own rules about ai and our own ethics around ai and so the ethics that we use in our organizations are the purpose of ai is to give us more time to spend with clients Mm -hmm. it's to give us more time to create new trends about the future 
it should give us that spaciousness that we can do better work. Mm -hmm. If it feels like we are using it as a crutch, if we feel like we're we're using it because we just don't feel like doing this thing and so have the AI develop 50 social media posts, that isn't the purpose of it. The purpose of it is to harness our creativity. And so how do we utilize it in that way and how do we create expectations within our organizations that that's how it's used? It's more like ethical AI. Yes. Have you seen cases of unethical AI usage? Yeah, yeah I think there. Uh, immediately AI is used by spammers and folks that are trying to take advantage. Every new technology tool is used that way. I think the challenge in our society is that our elected officials are 70 and 80 years old. They don't understand how these technologies work and they don't know how to legislate it. And so what we need to do is create... Um, guide rails around these tools about what they're allowed to do and not allowed to do, the databases and information that they have access to and what they don't have access to. And if my writing is being used to train AI, mm -hmm. I should be being paid for that yeah. expertise that I'm giving to it. If I've written an which, article... Which goes back to the writer's strike in yes, Hollywood. Yes, 100%. You can't replace the creativity of writers with AI. You can have really crappy quality work, which is which is what's going to happen. But if you want to use really skilled writers to train AI to write future asset episodes of a, a, a show based on what writers have created previously and the mm -hmm. sort of storylines that they have about these people and what that means, then pay those writers because the only reason the AI is able to do it is because the humans have done the work first. Yeah, before. And then that and that's human rights and yep. that's writers right and they should benefit from it and you, last time we spoke you talked about this 14 years old girl on twitter uh was it was it you and i talked I about this i think so um so there was a <laughs> there was a chat bot that was trained on twitter that mm -hmm. was intended to be a, a 13 or 14 year old girl and they were sort of training her to people talk with her and she responds and here's this sort of what are the pretend things that a teenage girl is concerned about within 24 hours of being live on Twitter she became a neo-nazi because that's what happens when you spend too much time on Twitter and so she was being trained by people that were tr you know trying to figure out what they could do with this tool but it it really shows you how malleable they are to what's being inputted The only reason that ChatGPT is a, a tool that we can actually use, because I've tried a lot of AI tools and they've all been really crappy. Mm. Um, the reason that this one works so well is Kenyan workers were paid $2 an hour to read the worst things on the internet to make sure that those things were not being used on ChatGPT. So to train it to not access things that are about mm. murder and child porn and racism, all of those things, it took human beings to train But it underpaid human beings and like ai farms yes who have psychological impacts from having to read all of those terrible things there's a human cost to ai and so how do we make sure that we are taking care of the human beings that are that are intersecting with these systems yeah because they're filtering They trained the AI to be digestible for mm -hmm. us. Yeah. But then these humans probably don't have social security or doctors. And then they're going to, they're in the world, like yes. ha having PTSD, trauma, yes. et cetera, yes. and being underpaid as well. For sure. So that's part of like the law, like, because like that would be a global United Nation yes. type of uh, enforcement where like there should be legislations. Because I've heard of a couple of San Francisco startups who are leveraging these human farms to train AI. Of course. Um, And then there's no consequence. And then right. you can make billions, mm -hmm. but actually you're not responsible for sustaining lives and, and, and mental health on yes. people in other countries. A million percent. Trista, it's been a blast to have this conversation with you about future trends and, and backcasting and forecasting. And one of the questions I have is, what is the future of education? And where have you seen in the world good positive examples of What could the world look like to to make sure that we set it up for success for the next generation? One, I think AI can be leveraged for really customized learning for children. And I think there is a ton of potential in that. Um, secondly, when it comes to like the 
future of child care and education, I have hosted these things called field trips to the future, where I take people to a place in the world that is already experiencing the future that you want to see. Wow. And so I took a group of um, folks from foundations and nonprofits and elected officials that were based in the United States to Sweden to see the the future of a, a fully paid for early childhood system. What did it look like? Um, there was 25 of them that attended and we visited um, child care centers. We visited um, training programs that were training teachers. We spent time in the city and got to see what it looked and felt like to be in a place that is heavily invested in children. Um, it was amazing to see little kids that were in nature preschools outdoors, one-year-olds toddling around by a, a by a campfire in the woods. And I'm, wow. like, I'm like, danger, danger. They're like, the kids have got it. It's totally great. Um, and just that freedom and flexibility to, to be people. They don't do testing and all those things that we do. What you're really doing is training folks to um, be good citizens and be good partners and human beings. And that's what we're missing in our system. So I think that investment of really making sure that um, kids are getting all the love and care that they need makes a huge difference. And how do, does it support families differently than in the U.S. or other countries? Well, one, it's very inexpensive, like $100 a week for child care. Wow, $100 But, uh, a week for child care. $100 a week. And the piece that was amazing to see when we visited one of these child cares is at the end of the night, they give the parents uh, a full cooked meal from the kitchen. Each of the child care centers has a chef. They create these amazing meals wow. for the kids. And so the families leave with dinner so that they don't have to worry about dinner. And I'm like, that is amazing to yeah. just care enough about um, families and communities that you're taking care of them in that way. It does a lot for folks' mental health. That's amazing. And then lastly, again, thank you so much for being on our podcast, uh, Driving mm -hmm. Impact. And yeah. um, I want to make sure that people are aware of all the workshop that you run on top of getting your book, uh, Future Good, on your website. So what are just types of uh, yeah. like workshop you, you, you run to, be, to help people become a little bit more like futuristic or better at uh, backcasting or forecasting? For sure. So we train people on how to use futurism. Uh, we have a program called Future Good Studio, which is a three-month program, just four hours a month. You're a part of a um, cohort and a network where you're spending time with other people that are trying to use futurism to make the world a better place. I also host mastermind retreats once a year. I think people need the time and space to think about their personal future. I have one happening in um, Palm Springs in the the spring of 2024. Ooh, you might it's see me there. We'll lovely. See. <laughs> it's a beautiful house with an amazing group of people. And so it's a great opportunity to really... Give yourself space to understand what your personal ideal future looks like and what's the legacy that you want to leave behind. That's amazing. Well, we'll put all the links so people can thank get you. to know you, get to know Future Good, and also keep learning from you. So thank you so much Kathleen, for coming. this has been so much fun. Thanks so much for having me today. Thank you. Appreciate it.